Good morning, everyone. We'll start in just a second. We'll give people another minute just to roll in and then we'll be all set. Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started. My name is Pamela Robinson. I'm a professor and I'm the director of the School of Urban and Regional Planning. And relevant to today's session, I'm the interim academic director of City Building Ryerson, which is our university wide initiative to mobilize and showcase city building and urban innovation from across our campus and beyond. We're so happy that you're joining us today for our Fresh Voices series. We've recently welcomed a number of new faculty members whose research focuses on a wide range of city building issues from various disciplines and methods. So the purpose of this webinar series is to showcase their research with you. We really want to shine a light on their ideas and their perspectives and research priorities. We're excited to introduce you to these new brains to our university and to provide a platform for you to engage with us in our university and city builders across the greater Toronto area. This is the second last session in the series. They've all been fascinating so far. If you've missed any, you can find the recordings on our website. Before we begin, I'd like to um, confirm our recognition that Toronto is in the Dish With One Spoon territory. The Dish With One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship and respect. We share this land acknowledgement today as part of our active recognition of the work that we need to do to, in terms of truth and reconciliation with Indigenous communities of people in our country. You may also have heard that in August 2021, our university announced that it's going to begin a renaming process to reconcile the legacy of Egerton, Egerton Ryerson for a more inclusive future. If you're interested in this process, you can find out more information from the Ryerson University's next chapter page, and that process is ongoing and active, so we hope to hear new news in the new year. Before we begin the webinar, let's just start with a few housekeeping items. What we're going to do is we're going to start with an informal presentation in a minute, um, followed by questions and answers from you, and you'll have a chance to ask uh, lots of interesting questions to Rania um, after she presents her work. This whole session lasts 45 minutes total. There's about 30 minutes of formal presentation. And then after that point, we'll move into what we call the after party, where if you want to stick around, um, you can ask questions directly um, by turning on your microphone. But in the formal webinar session, you can put your questions in the Q&A and I'll facilitate that process. If you're on Twitter, please tag us at, at CityBuildingRU and contribute using the Fresh Voices hashtag. This one is, this series is, um, has been recorded, as we said, and they'll be shared widely. So you can follow up and watch again, and you can also go back and see the sessions that you might've missed. Okay, enough with housekeeping. Let's get on with the important business. I'm really excited today to introduce uh, our new colleague, Rania Hamza. Dr. Hamza is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil Engineering, and her areas of research focus on um, aerobic granular sludge, biological nutrient removal, removal of emerging contaminants, energy and resource recovery, and wastewater treatment. I got a good quote from her. The fact that nobody wants to talk about wastewater annoys me because as long as humans are alive, it's gonna exist. With more industrial developments, people and urban cities, we're seeing pharmaceuticals, chemicals, and new pollutants that are no longer benign waste. So to solve this problem, her research focuses on aerobic granular sludge, which is a process of trying to figure out how to use naturally occurring bacteria to consume the organic matter in sewage. So it's gonna be a really exciting session. So what we've planned, with Dr. Hamza is that um, she's going to introduce her research with a handful of slides and then I've got some questions and you're welcome to also post questions in the Q&A box below and we'll make this uh, responsive and interactive and engaging to your work. So Dr. Hamza over to you why don't you introduce your work and show us what you're um, what you're going to talk about today. Thanks Bamela so much for the introduction and thanks for inviting me to this amazing uh webinar, I'm really excited to, uh, to talk about my research and share my, uh, my work with everyone. Uh, so uh, maybe I will start by sharing my screen, introduce the work a little bit, and then I will welcome um, questions and discussion from the audience and, and you and everyone. And for our participants, you don't have to wait until the end to put your questions in. The sooner you put them in, the sooner we can get you answers. Okay. okay. So shall I, do you see my screen? We do, off you go. 
Yeah, so uh, what I'm going to share with everyone today is really uh, a little bit about the, the concept of wastewater biorefinery, uh, which, which is more, uh, it, it's, it's not really my, uh, my invention, it's the trend worldwide that we need to, to understand more about wastewater as a resource, not as a, a burden. And um, the, the idea that wastewater treatment plants are now resource recovery or biorefineries that we're actually mining resources out of them. So before I start, I just want to acknowledge and uh, shout out to my uh, my research team, uh, Victoria, she's my PhD candidate, Zanina, Fatima Zahra, Julian Morgan, and Mohamed al Asar. Uh, they're all working on um, different projects that's very much related, and I'm going to share some of their uh, current research work as well through this presentation. So that... Like when we started like Google wastewater, you'll start to say wastewater. And we've all at certain point in time, we think of wastewater as a water that has been a waste, which is really what it is. So just breaking down the word, word wastewater, I just actually used water. So it's still water, H2O, with some addition, which we call it Mr. X, the pollutant X that we're having. And Really, wastewater treatment is all about removing the dax, or that's a conventional way. Just remove the pollutant because we want to recover back our water, which is the H2O. But now it's becoming a new thing that we don't only want to recover our water. We really want to know what's in that wastewater as other resources that we can recover in this concept of cradle to cradle. We, we don't really need to have a cradle to grave anymore, although it's like... We cannot avoid it, but we still we still need to recover the water and much more. So just briefly going through the basic objective of wastewater treatment. So we want to protect the water quality of the receiving water bodies because they're also our drinking water sources. Through removing some like uh, fancy terms here, we need to remove the organics with whatever terms that we use. We need to remove the solids or the suspended solids. We want to destroy or deactivate the pathogenic microorganisms. And we want to remove nutrients, which is the nitrogen and phosphorus. Now we're also seeing new contaminants, which are called emerging contaminants or contaminants of emerging concern, CEC. These are new contaminants that I'm gonna speak a, bit, a little bit about them. and. These are all results of our urban developments. And that's why we think these are no longer benign. Conventional system are no longer able to remove them. And it's our job now to think of how to remove them, how to prevent them from getting into our drinking water sources and also protect the fish. So this is a little bit of a scary picture of Lake Erie that was taken by NASA Observatory in 2015 and it shows an algal bloom. And this is not the good algae, this is what we call the bad algae. It's a type of bacteria called cyanobacteria. And the problem with that, it's abundant when there are nutrients in the water, which is nitrogen and phosphorus. And when these are abundant, algal bloom happens and some of this is actually toxic to fish, like the cyanobacteria, and they also threaten the drinking water sources. And they have been attributed to many sources. They cost a lot of money to be treated. So the sources are really called the cultural eutrophication, which is a fancy word for the algal bloom. And they come from different sources, whether from urban runoffs, whether from excess nitrogen and phosphorus in the agriculture uh, runoffs, whether from wastewater treatment plants or treating water to remove or the treating the wastewater to remove the nutrients and the organic material, but they're not doing that efficiently enough or they're not reaching the level that our natural earth's capacity or the water capacity can assimilate. So it's becoming too much, add to that the industrial developments and so many other things. So we're reaching really a situation where our, we are beyond the earth's capacity and we need to do something about it. So the idea is basically we need to control it. We need to control the nutrients before getting into the wastewater, in the wastewater before discharging them into the surface waters. So I am fascinated by the concept of a biological treatment because it has an economic advantage. We really convert, we have the capability of converting the waste into renewable material and it's a natural process. No toxic byproducts are consumed, which is fantastic because we can treat the wasps with many chemical processes, but we are left with questionable byproducts. So biological treatment really uses natural organisms that's occurring. And this is a picture of a conventional activated sludge system, which is employed in most of the wastewater, big, I would say, municipal wastewater treatment plants. There are other many technologies, I would say, that rely on microorganisms. The problem, the conventional systems have been, like activated sludge has been there for over 100 years, and it's been used over 100 years. It's not, it's not. I would say modernized, while think of your car, you're not gonna be driving a car that's 100 years old. 
So the same for many things. So technological advances needs to get uh, into the wastewater treatment and it's getting slowly, but it's not as fast as we want. So really innovation is not, I would say on the pace that we wanted. So just talking about back to what are these emerging contaminants. So emerging contaminants are all of this that you see in the pictures. So they are compounds. Um, we, we kind of conducted a project with the um, Tri-Council and it was a knowledge synthesis and we came up with this. So I want to shout out to Dr. Galbride and Dr. Patricia Hanya who were actually co-applicants on, uh, on this uh, proposal and this fantastic work. And we come up with a nice definition that they are detected and they pose risk to human, but they're not currently monitored, which leaves us with the lack of clarity about the amounts being discharged. And we see them every day. These are personal care products or PCP, PCPs, which are cosmetics, so shampoos, detergents, name it. Pharmaceuticals, including the NSAID and endocrine disruptors, the antibiotics, which are a big problem. We're also seeing the microplastics and the microfibers that come from our washing machines and the dryers. And we have, it was, it's more of a legacy compound, or they call it the forever compound, the per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, we call them for short PFAS. And these are compounds that has uh, properties that make them very, very much appreciated in, uh, in many things like fly retardants, Teflon pans, rainwear cots, shiny lipsticks. So these are compounds that pose uh, properties that we really want them, but their problem is they are very, very resistant to degradation. So that's why the name forever chemicals came. So they all end up into the wastewater treatment plant. And believe it or not, wastewater treatment plants were never designed to remove these. They were never designed. A wastewater treatment plant was designed to remove organics and nutrients. They were not they were designed to remove that. So now we're expecting them to do something that we never designed them or we're asking too much of the treatment plant. And that's why we really need to look into how to do that uh, to address these new changes. So just briefly talking about per and polyfluoroalkyl substance, it's a chemical or organic compound that has a very strong CF bond and there are over 400, 4,700 or 4,700 identified PFAS and there are so many more. This is again a picture showing that wastewater treatment plants when we did some studies on the um, removals of, uh, of, of these PFAS compounds or perfluoroalkyl uh, compounds, uh, they're actually having negative removal. So there's a production actually from the wastewater treatment plant, which is scary. And again, they end up in our soil, which we use the sludge as a soil amendment. We are ending up with surface water, which is actually ending up to be our drinking water. And so there's a lots of of risk that we, we, we are having, whether humans or even environments and fish. Again, microplastics. Microplastics has been shown in many, many things, whether fragmentation of larger plastics, the washing of clothing machine, the waste mismanagement, industrial waste, and they go to the surface water, whether directly or indirectly. So my research is, is mainly focused on uh, um, trying to use biological treatment and um, uh, during my PhD, I worked on aerobic granular sludge, which is which is really has been uh, there for at least I would say 25 years or 20, 25 years, and it's an idea of microbials uh, getting together in or immobilized or aggregating without the need of a carrier, and this is how they look in, in, in our experiments that we've done before. And the beauty about this is that they. <clears throat> They have a much, much, uh, when they amass together, this is a, a scanning electron microscope image, when they amass together or get together in a microbial aggregate, they have high biomass and also concentration, which makes them do lots of, like they're having lots of something. And also they have better settling properties and they also get together different microbial communities who do different jobs. They are diverse, they have um, properties that we are, uh, welcoming in the treatment process, and they also have a smaller footprint because they are getting together and mensing in a, or aggregating. So this is some of the picture of the work that we've done before, whether uh, in my lab or in my previous work. Um, and they're like, look at like this one of the microbic, microscopic imaging that's showing you like um, some aggregates of the biomass and how some other microorganisms uh, like protozoans and other kind of microbial community are flourishing, which is we're having an immense, uh, I would say millions of microorganisms getting together. So this is showing some, some sort of the microstructure of the granules and how we can actually uh, cultivate different types of organisms who does different jobs. The problem so far is that the 
cultivation is very much tied to a process of a sequential batch reactor, which is a little bit less popular in big municipalities who work on continuous flow. And part of my research is to, to optimize this process and see what are the different applications, how we can work on the resource recovery, how can we work on uh, treating toxic chemicals, how can we work on these emerging contaminants, how to integrate it with other systems, whether biological or even chemical or even membrane filtration. So ideally the treatment takes care of all this excess. So the conventional treatment, we have a pretreatment and then we need to have different zones for nutrient removal, whether anoxic or anaerobic or aerobic. And then we need to have what we call a clarifier with an aerobic granular sludge system. The idea is to have a pretreatment and everything happened in the same tank. But again, this might not be the ideal solution for all municipalities. And that's why uh, my, part of my research is working on optimizing the system, as I mentioned. And just to give you a, a quick overview of what's a biorefinery. So I'm, I'm working on, like I would say, um, three parallel, um, I would say the research direction, the idea of enrichment of specific functional groups. So really training the bacteria to do what we want them and feeding them what we want them to eat and making them eat it efficiently through what we call system engineering. And to do some potential application and proof of concept for removal of nutrients, which is already established, but we want to optimize that removal of pharmaceuticals. I'm working now, like I mentioned, on removal of microplastic fibers from the wastewater using the aerobic granule sludge and PFAS, which is a fluorinated organic compounds, like we mentioned. On a parallel stream, I'm also working on recovering some of the material from the waste granular sludge now, like uh, polymers. Energy has been established to be recovered from wastewater. Anaerobic digestion has been used for years and years and has been working, but now let's see how it's gonna work when we're changing the, the structure of, I would say, of the microorganisms. Are we be able to harness the energy or the biogas? And these material are rich of polymers. So it has been actually many, 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 applications in Europe, and some of them went from the lab scale to a full scale, that they're recovering what we call alginate like uh, or ALE um, polymers, which has properties like polymers, they can also be used as adsorbents to recover more material or also aid in, in, in recovering phosphorus and at the same time cleaning the water. So this is basically um, uh, 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 like if I would say a glimpse of my research and I again want to shout out to all my students who have been supported and to my two children here in the picture who are also been supported of all my work and of course the funding agencies in CERC, uh, the Faculty of Engineering and Architectural Science and also the Tri Council and the Urban Water Research Center. Um, yeah, I hope I, I was not very boring. <laughs> Thank you. That was super exciting and interesting. Uh, okay, I've got so many questions I wanna ask you and, and I'm gonna encourage all of our participants to start populating the Q&A and we'll come to you in a minute. I think the first thing I wanna ask you, um, when you talk about your research, first of all, it's, it's really exciting to talk to a scientific researcher who's able to take what they do in the lab and help kind of broad general public folks understand what they're doing. And you talk about yourself as being the bacteria whisperer. And I'm curious, when the bacteria talk or when they whisper, what do they say to you? What well, have you learned from bacteria? <laughs> they do talk. And I think it's, it's not only me being a bacteria whisperer. I think anybody who's working in wastewater or biological wastewater treatment understands very well that you can't yell at the bug to work. So we need to whisper. We can't yell to them really. So we just need to talk to them. And the whispering thing is all about the training. Like I said, we need to tame them, control them to do a specific kind of function. And there are different types of microorganisms doing different functions. And all what we need is to make them happy, put them in the conditions that would make them do what we want to do. And that requires training. So this is where the whispering. And yes, they do talk, they give us signals when they're happy, when they're upset. And there's so many what we call operational and engineering controls that we can use. And like, again, just don't yell at the bugs. Think of what they need to do. And this is where the word whispering, and it was more related to my friends and family. Whenever I go around, talk about bugs and talk to bugs, if I call them bugs, they are much more than bad. Um, so yeah, and I started by yelling at them and they didn't respond. So when I started whisper, they did. So I'm really curious about the arc of your research career. Where did you start and 
where, where were you in the middle and how did you end up at Ryerson? Because we're not the first university where you've had a research lab, right? Uh, as, a, as an independent researcher, Ryerson is my first uh, academic institution, but before I was more of a, a student, like I, I think everybody who's, who's, who's in this career has been a student and for a long time, <laughs> I suppose. Uh, but my, my idea, I didn't start at wastewater. I started with water, to be honest with you. And this is when I was our undergrad. I was very intrigued by the fact that water is essential, but water is destructive. We can, we really need water. We can't live without water, but look at water when we have floods, it's uncontrollable. And this is what has been done from civilizations, from the very ancient, like I'm Egyptian, I was born and raised in Egypt and ancient Egyptians were the ones who started to build dams and garages and, to control water. So I started by looking at water, fascinated by the fact that since the emergence of civilization, water has been the essence of everything. People migrated to go to places where there is water, go to the valley, build dams to control the water, build facilities to know how to store the water or how to control it when it's, it's drought situations or flooding situation. And, and later on, I realized the idea of a waste and how we're thinking of a waste as a, as a burden. And this is where I started my career. I started actually by, um, by working in reuse of wastewater and irrigation during my master's. And I had to stop because I was pregnant and I was a little bit scared of bugs. And when I came back, of course the project didn't wait. So I had to jump into another project and I jumped into a project where I selected, um, I was working in one of the very nice places in, in Cairo, which was an industrial, um, an, a natural protectorate area. And just the neighboring is an industrial cluster for marble and granite. And I could see mountains of slurry that solidified. And that waste is very high pH, highly alkaline, makes you a beautiful protectorate. So I said, like, why don't we just take that waste and see what's going on with it? So I started working with the government. I have a very supportive supervisor and I was very supportive from the Ministry of Industry. And I started to do the work of how to transform the waste to value added products. And we changed the word recycling from recycling to upcycling. We are adding value to the products and diverting the waste from being a waste to our material and a resource. But that comes with a cost. And this is where the fact that annoys me that we're really thinking of the waste as the waste, but we are complaining that we are reaching the Earth's capacity to assimilate but we need to do some effort. It might be expensive at the beginning. It might be to recover this material expensive, but we are working on economy of scale. We're working on developing the systems and we might need to go through the research to, to understand a little bit more about more of the science part. And this is another shift in my life. When I started my PhD back to the area where I had, I got back to like, I started like I told you with industrial solid waste, which is my background in construction and building material. And I was building bricks and building the cultured marble and adding the waste to cement a clinker, things like that. And when I had a, another opportunity to restart during my PhD, I went back to wastewater because this is the biggest volume and, 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 and the biggest amount. Um, I realized that back to bugs or back to microorganisms, part of the of the whispering has to do with understanding the science. And there's has been always a disconnection between science and engineering. Engineers are more into the application science are more into the fundamentals. Engineers are using the fundamentals to develop the system. But engineering helps me under the quest, answer the question of how to do things, how things work, how things fail. But it never answered the questions of why. And that's why I really wanted to do this kind of, if I would say marriage between science and engineering, being an engineer, I appreciate science and I, I, I'm not a scientist, but I wish I am. And I try to collaborate with scientists to answer questions related to the engineering with like, it's, it's what, like, again, it's water. So this is the one thing that we can say, oh, we're not going to, we're not, we're going to get rid of water. We're not going to use water. We, we must use it. You know, it's so interesting. One of the things that is a thread that runs through Ryerson researchers is that so much of the research that we're all individually doing really depends on connecting with other researchers. And your lab, your new lab is housed in our Center for Urban Innovation, right? And so you have lab space, but you also have the chance to connect with other Ryerson urban water researchers, for example. And so 
we're really trying as a university to make it easier for these ideas and research projects to collide so that we can scale up the impacts in terms of, of making a difference in real communities with real people. Uh, I'm gonna abandon my questions because there's two really good ones so far in the chat and our participants should feel free to keep adding. Um, the first one comes from Stephen Tang. Uh, and Stephen is asking, is the application of these bacteria limited to geographic locations, for example, wastewater quality, temperature, et cetera? Um, I would say, first of all, thanks, Stephen, for the question. Really nice one. And I would say uh, this technology has not been yet implemented in full scale in Canada uh, so far. And this is not really a technological, uh, I would say, uh, a hiccup or a technological uh, issue. It's more about uh, municipalities are by nature uh, risk adverse because it's it's a big responsibility, right? Water is related to public safety and 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 public health, and to to kind of implement a new technology, it has to go through many stages, and. Um, we, we, we don't really, I would say, have this kind of, uh, of uh, <laughs> risk taking yet, uh, but it has been implemented, if I would say, I, up to my knowledge, there's at least 70 plants, seven zero plants across the world that implement this technology from different technology providers. There are some that are really on the front end or the front, uh, I would say, um, key players in the market, and there are some that are catching up, and there's different, uh, I would say, um, uh, tweaks and changes to the to the to the technology. The plants that has been started as small plants, and now I can see bigger municipalities using that. Um, throughout the, the process, it has been so far implemented in the sequential batch reactor, which is it's not a batch reactions, but it is more everything happens in the same time. This is the idea of the batch reaction. So that that leaves a little bit of a question about very big scale, like if we say add bridges, wastewater treatment plants, it's treating I think over over them 800 uh, megagallons per per or a million uh, gallons per day, uh, but it has been implemented in different scale, different industries. Uh, there are different uh, types of wastewater I started with industrial application and then it creeped into municipal application. Uh, all the reported literature is very successful, but we don't have, I would say, an example in Canada to say, well, we have a real one here and we, we hope at least to start piloting and, and, and get something to, to start it out very, very soon. You know, it's super interesting as a planner, when I hear you talk about municipalities being risk averse, and um, what I'm seeing in my own research is we see pilot projects around policies and programs, but not so much around infrastructure, in part because of the reasons that you know that there are, you know, public health and safety outcomes. Uh, if the experiment fails, we're, we're putting people at risk. It really, to me, begs the question of what's the role of a university in a community university research partnership? Like, do we have the ability to build a parallel system where we could test it and pilot it, improve it before a municipality made an investment? Because... You know, the estimates of, the, of Canada's infrastructure deficit run between 110 and $270 billion right now. And so there's a natural state of good repair series of investments that are long overdue. And so if you can get the research road tested as these infrastructure investments come online, I think there's a tremendous opportunity in terms of the future of wastewater treatment in the country. If we can time the research outcomes to be demonstrable before these investments are made, because if we're not, the window is going to close for another 50 to 70 years, because that's the lifespan of these technologies, right? So, okay, next question from Joe Nasser. Um, Joe is a longtime Ryerson based researcher, um, and Joe contributes to the Center for um, Studies in Food Security. Joe um, says, Thanks a lot for the rich talk. As someone who has worked for three decades on urban and peri-urban agriculture, there has all along been an interest in how to connect food production in cities with the use of urban waste, including so-called wastewaters. Uh, and Joe's first publication is really interesting, question this notion of waste. Um, he's interested to know how is the current biorefinery approach um, connected to urban food production? Uh, this is a very interesting question. Thanks, Joe, very much. And, and recently, we were trying to put together with the, with the Department of Geography and Chris, um, Chris Willen uh, was, was part of that work. We're trying to get together how can we um, do what we call urban, urban infrastructure in terms of uh, green roofs or, um, or, 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 or urban, urban landscaping to use it with the, with the treated, I would say, wastewater. Um, 
I know that there is tons of research already on the reuse of wastewater in irrigation. There is not a lot of work that has been done on urban uh, farming or urban um, uh, landscaping up to my knowledge. Again, uh, urban, urban uh, uh, green roofs and, uh, and urban landscaping is not really my area, but I would love to see how we can use this wastewater that's treated and then add this to these soils and see how, how it's gonna re uh, uh, react. There's two things into it. This is, uh, I would say, the first thing is I do need to worry too much about pathogens. I'm worried more about these emerging contaminants, to be honest. Like, because we don't know they're they're they are very small amounts. But the thing is, even in the nanogram range, they are accumulating. They kind of bioaccumulate, and we don't know what's going to happen. That's why I think the best way to know is to have long-term studies and see what's going to happen. Are we accumulating? And I actually believe that soils can actually help removal. There's lots of absorption. There's lots of so many uh, interactive and synerg synergistic effects that can happen to maybe even break down these uh, emerging contaminants. Um, again, I can't get absolute answers without doing the research, but it's a very, I would say, uh, interesting area of research that I, I would love to jump in whenever there's an opportunity. That's great. Okay, I just looked at the time. It's just 11.30. So what we're going to do is we're going to formally wrap up the official part of this webinar right now. Um, I just want to remind everyone that the recording will be posted today. Uh, and if you're interested, you can tune in on November 25th, where uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Samantha Big Leary from the School of Urban and Regional Planning, is going to talk about her research that focuses on creating neighborhoods that are more hospitable and inclusive for people living with dementia. We've got over 7,500 uh, 750,000 people in Canada um, living with dementia and over 50 million living worldwide. And so Samantha's research shows how urban design can help people stay in their homes and communities longer. It's a really thoughtful um, and interesting piece of research. So I hope that you'll join us. Um, soon this recording will be posted. Uh, and if you wanna hang on in just a minute, we'll end the formal session, but you're welcome to stick around like we would if we were in the real world. Uh, it'd be like hanging around at the front of the classroom. You can ask Dr. Hamza questions directly. Before we hang up officially, I wanna thank um, Luke and Claire Pfeiffer for their behind the scenes work on at City Building Ryerson for helping us run this webinar series. And thank you to Dr. Hamza for sharing just a peek of your very important and impactful research. Thank you. Thanks Pamela so much. All right, folks. So if you wanna stick around, we're happy you put up your hand, you can turn on your mic if you wanna ask any questions or you can put it in the chat and I can ask it for you, but we're happy for you, um, happy for you to ask any questions if you like. Okay, uh, Michelle Caron, do you wanna, Luke, can we unmute Michelle? How about this, do you hear me? Yeah, we do, thank you. Okay, very well, thank you, Professor Hamza. Uh, a very simple question. We've heard so much about the virus mutations. What about bacteria? Do they mutate? And is there any potential for, uh, uh, you know, altering, for them altering the process or having, you know, unpredictable effects? Or I, I don't even know how to ask the question, but you see where I'm, where, where what I'm curious about. Yeah. Would yeah. you? Thank you. So thank you, Michelle, for the question. And that's a very good question. When I started working with, with microorganisms, I was as worried as you, and like I told you, that's why at a certain uh, point in my career, I, uh, I refrained to work with microorganisms when I feel like I was like um, having a baby or things like that. But to be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I'm an engineer who works with what we call mixed culture and mixed culture are naturally occurring organisms. So what mm -hmm. I really do I, do, I do use engineering controls, not genetic controls. So I don't really do any genetic engineering. I don't change the genes. I don't use pure culture, which is a, a big part of the research. Again, I do appreciate science, but my work is more onto the naturally. So I don't, I don't really grow super bugs. I just take the naturally occurring. So for example, when I seed my system, I go to the Ashbridge's wastewater treatment plant take some of their sludges, which is really naturally occurring. The idea is just you're getting a large amount of it. So mm -hmm. if you put a, an apple on there, your tabletop, leave it for a few months, you will see bacteria growing on it and it will start to eat it up. So these are kind mm -hmm. of the bacteria we're talking about. Bacteria is everywhere on our hands and 
this does not mean that we don't have nasty ones or pathogenic ones because human waste comes from humans and people are sick and there are cross things happening. Uh, mm. I, I didn't really I didn't really get into the mutations of bacteria, but there is another problem, which is uh, the antibiotic resistant genes, which is more related to again anthropogenic activity. Antibiotics are not in pristine water. Antibiotic is a man-made, uh, I would say, pharmaceutical material that we introduce, and this there is a pharmaceutical um, or an effect on the antibiotic resistant genes where we start to see these genes and coming from one, jumping from one bacteria to the other. And we started to see the antibiotic resistant genes. Uh, and that has been studied. That has been so long time. And my <laughs> are working with them to, to see that. Uh, it's again, it's related more to our activity, not to the engineering process of the, of the, of the, of the, of the of treatment, uh, there's some research that says with engineering controls, we can limit or we can increase or decrease certain certain types of, I would say, genetic interactions. Uh, but again, this is on a very uh, low level uh, uh, in terms of, um, I would say, risk. But yes, antibiotic resistance genes are a risk, but the risk is because of the presence of antibiotics. So it would be how to reduce antibiotics which has been there so everything is like prescribed or vet this used to be antibiotic given to vets for like to to animals for growth now this is banned uh, but yeah that's a really it's a really good question yeah michelle i had the okay. same question so i'm glad you asked it. i was thinking about it with steven's okay. question about bacterial differences regionally and i wondered uh, if yes. like yes. you know if bacteria, we're gonna have like awesome bacteria from one part of Ontario and different ones from another part. So Rene, can I ask you like, this builds on Michael's question. So hand sanitizer is antibacterial, antibacterial soap. During the pandemic, we've seen a significant increase in use of these products. How persistent are they? Like, you know, when you wash your hands, like how long does that chemical stay in the water system? I, I have to say that was a good question. And when, whenever this pandemic started, I was very much interested to check that out. Yeah. See, because we have a tremendous increase in the amount of uh, chemicals that enters. And uh, what happens is that I was expecting to see changes. But the, the real life application showed us that because of, uh, like if we're talking about Toronto, uh, most of the wastewater go to the three big uh, plants and they end up in somehow and that's a very big big municipality and this is where when you have a, at the end of the day a small quantity with respect to a bigger quantity you start to you don't see the impact so, so it's dilution see, yeah it's exactly but it's not it's kind of the dilution effect or the which has been for so long the solution of pollution is dilution which is bad but i think <laughs> we didn't see changes. so municipalities did not report changes I just remember there was one time a small a small uh, senior home that they started to see some problems with the concrete material, and we oh. didn't know what was the imp it was related to the change in the disinfectant is what is related we couldn't really tell uh, without getting studies we didn't see any changes in the in the treatment process but they reported some um, issues with with the concrete material. Uh, but it, but we didn't really hammer on the on the real cause. Is it because of introduction of a new chemical that's not, or is it because of sanitizers? Uh, but the proven thing so far is this did not have effect on the treatment process, or there was no reporting of an effect on the treatment process because of this. On the other hand, there was a problem with on the use of wipes and glo and gloves on the screens. Right. Which is why they would say, do not dispose flushable wipes. And yeah. I think this is a big talk about that from Barry Orr, who's been yeah. advocating about do, flushables are not really flushables. No. So this is, was the actually the more concern. It's about the clogging of the screens, the issues with flushables not being flushables and not being biodegradable as they are advertised and also the, the gloves that we throw. Uh, so yeah, another another reminder: toilets are not garbage cans. 
you know, it's just for our participants who are still here. Barry Orr um, is a graduate student uh, in our in enzyme and environmental science and management. Barry is also a municipal staff person who works in wastewater treatment. So his career is a really interesting example of practice driving research. He came back to do the research on the thing that was pr really problematic in his practice. So he's a really awesome Ryerson success story. Yeah. Um, we've got a bunch of people still here. Anybody else want to ask a question? Okay, Michelle, I'm going to ask you to hang on just one second because we'll see if anyone sure. else gives someone else a chance to jump in. Okay, you can go, Michelle. And then if anyone else has, just put your hand up or put a send us a note in the, the Q&A or the chat and I'll call on you too. Okay, Michelle, over to you. Uh, Rania, hi, Michelle here again. Um, I wonder how applicable your research will be in uh, continent uh, where everything remains to be done, like in sub-Saharan sub -Saharan Africa, where I do most of my work, they have to start from scratch. Can they bypass the way maybe, uh, you know, they did with the cell phones, all, bypass all the wiring of the continent that, that we had to do here, for example, like should they, what would, do you have a perspective on this as your research so focused that it's not really part of your consideration? Are, are you looking to venues and applicability in various types of contexts. Africa has to build essentially all the wastewater treatment plants that say an equivalent population has like the United States in the next 20 years, they're gonna have 350 million more people in the urban areas. Uh, and I'm talking sub-Saharan here, not uh, the MENA countries. Um, do you have a perspective on this? I just wanted to open on that uh, front, uh, but you may not. I don't know, maybe your research is so focused on, uh, you know, technical considerations in a new world, new world context or, you know, occidental context. Um, so that's my question. Would you elaborate on this, please? Thank you. So again, a very interesting question, Michelle. Really thank you for this. So um, to, to be honest with you, I'd love to work uh, more on, uh, on the access to safe drinking water in Africa and also on the um, treatment sanitation. Um, again, it's, it's a worldwide thing. It's uh, the sustainable developing goal, uh, access to safe drinking water and sanitation. Uh, the problem is that we need to, to look uh, in this, I, I think it's, it should be the same way we're looking in our uh, attempt to, to do some reconciliation with the indigenous communities here. We need to put them on the table. Maybe the technology that work in a developed country does not work in some of the developed countries. Access or, or uh, availability of technical expertise might be problematic. So the uh, availability of advanced treatments uh, and sensors and everything is, 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 is nice and fancy, but it was might be a little bit uh, challenging in remote areas. And uh, when we don't have like, I don't think that they might have a reliable internet access if you talk to them. I don't think that they can use this data science and, and the big data and the SCADA systems. We need to know what's the available there. And wastewater treatment has been there for years and depending on the needs and we might have some other problems if we have in urban cities like i said industrial input might not be there so the treatment has to be tailored towards the 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 the, the community and I'm, I'm, i always believe that it's not a lack of technology it's a lack of going there applying it and thinking what is there and a, a wastewater treatment is really a system of components so it depends on what you want to achieve. If I want to achieve really treatment of organic and I can set a treatment. If I want to really achieve uh, a treatment for uh, nutrients, I can train, like I said, the biological system to do that. So it's not the lack of the technology, it's the lack of, I would say, the will and also uh, being able to, to, to help with some also availability of uh, funding. This is another thing that these countries are lacking. Do they have good funding and, and access. And I, like I said, they need to be on the table, determine their needs, and then we can provide solutions. Mm. Okay, Rania, we got one last question. I'm gonna give it to Joe Nasser, and then we're gonna wrap up. Joe, over to you, we're gonna unmute you. Off you go. Oh, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks again, uh, Rania. Uh, let me just to follow up on this last question, but maybe also my earlier question. Uh, so in, in terms of uh, the 
I mean, there are, as you said, uh, I mean, reuse of wastewater has been around for ages. Uh, so can you say more like, like I, I visited, uh, for instance, uh, pilot projects related to that in Morocco, Tunisia, and uh, Jordan, from what I remember. So like going beyond the pilot uh, projects that, uh, that are small um, and that can be successful, but not necessarily like the scaling up from the smaller, and the question, I mean, whether to scale up or is, is are smaller scale applications more suited to the new approaches of bio mining, or is it the com is the complexity of it to the contrary uh, reinforces larger municipal uh, uh, systems that would enable that to happen? So, kind of the question of scale and and the inertia in changes uh, that come with it. Uh, thanks, Joel, very much. Another, another really very good question. So, so the concept of having it done or not done, we always look around and we see examples and we say, if it's been done somewhere else, we can do it. So Singapore doesn't have water resources. They used to import the water from Malaysia and then they started to do NE water. So to just Google NE water, they literally have wastewater make it drinking water and so it's doable so the idea of putting wastewater into even a drinking water level is 100 percent doable it all has to do with the amount of treatment needed and the cause that has been put way to the benefit again need is the mother of invention singapore didn't have water so they had to do that because it was cheaper for them and more sustainable and it has water is a national it's 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 kind of uh, national security commodity. It's not being able to produce that water is a problem. Gulf doesn't have any fresh water, so they need to resort to desalination. If we talk about desalination here in Canada, I don't think there's any research that I know of that does desalination in Canada. So it's all about, I would say also the misconception that we have plenty of water. We don't, and this is a misconception that we need to change, but it also based on the need. If we're happy with what we have, we don't have the urge or like you said, the inertia, the momentum to go forward. Regarding your second part of the question with whether to go from lab scale to full scale or whether to pilot, I don't really have, I would say, a, a right or wrong answer. It all depends on the political will and the direction. There are so many people who would say or many approaches that would say, when you go full scale, you learn fast and you, you feel fast, so you learn fast. So this is another, I would say, business. I would say I'm not a, I'm not a business, but kind of a business model, like start your project very fast, put it into practice. You will fail fast, but you will also learn fast. And that has to go with the amount of risk that we want to make. And in my opinion, I would, I'm a little bit more conservative. Um, uh, and I, I agree that we might need to do good lab scale, go piloting, but it has to do with this public-private partnership, which we really don't have much here. Uh, it's more into Europe and other countries who really succeeded to, to boost innovation, to push innovation, to go from lab to full scale, that they had this partnership being there, that they are capable of pushing that with, with really only academia pushing or research pushing, I don't think we can we can reach that goal of innovation or boosting innovation or applying innovation very fast into the full scale applications. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, again, again, it's a very big question. There is no right or wrong way, but I think the political will and the conversations again, the disconnection between science engineers, policymakers, they need to sit down and talk. And there's so many things that I learned from like uh, policy and regulation and the learned from science. And I believe I shared some of the application that we look into from the engineering perspective. I think it's really important just on a final note when we think about, about kind of piloting and, and innovative projects, the question of who are we innovating with um, or innovating on is also really important too. You know, like sometimes, like as you said, like necessity is the mother of invention. Um, but we have to be careful that we're not forcing our, our kind of innovative research that which is untried on people who are in desperate circumstances, right? Just because Sub-Saharan Africa has a 
underdeveloped or, or not yet implemented wastewater treatment center doesn't mean that there are pilot site for experimentation, right? Correct. Because we, no, no. we can't, no, no, I, you weren't saying that, but it's this interesting dilemma that, especially with tech innovators, they don't have to talk about who bears the risk of the innovation, right? And that's where I think universities have a really important role to play because we know how to mitigate risk. That's part of what we're trying Correct. to do as researchers. Yep. Um, and there is funding that we can experiment with. And so it's a really vital social contribution, I think, of research. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just to follow up on this, I agree 100 percent because also water has to do with vulnerability. And we, we, we don't really mean by any means when we're, we're connecting to that, that we have kind of uh, like vulnerable people as our like picky face. No. no. Uh, that's why the labs and just to divert a little bit that's one of the reasons like I think we we just got the faculty of engineering and architectural, architectural science offered us a very nice lab in the CUI building and part of our design was um, uh, like Dr. Bishbishi and I are, are sharing this beautiful lab facility where we're, we're opening up very soon and part of it was to design the lab so that it can host a pilot and that's part of the planning was to do how to do mobile furniture so that we can really a host a pilot and like you said in, in in universities are designed to mitigate risk we know that there are research risks we know how to mitigate it we have all the required training we'll have the biosafety we have the chemical safety it's a very controlled nice environment with uh, with researchers who are trained to kind of mitigate the risk and it's a very good starting point to start piloting um in universities and maybe after that to start to have even pilots in a real treatment plant with, with the full control so that we can yep. uh, avoid any, I would say, mistakes or, or uh, yeah. And, and also I have to say that uh, there's always what we call double barriers. You know, in the design, we have the factory safety. Wastewater is not designed that if it failed in one side, like like I said, it's a series of treatment and we do, we do have the factor of safety. We do have the double measure that we don't end up with having a problem. We do have, um, um, each municipality has their contract to operate with their environmental compliance agreement. They know their limits. They they do daily checks or weekly checks yeah. have to meet. So there's double barriers. And I don't think it's easy to, to pass one treatment after the other and after the other. Again, it's not one black box. It's a series of treatment that, that make sure that at the end, the product is safe for the public. Which is what citizens are counting on, or residents are counting on their municipalities doing. Okay, we could keep going, but we got to stop. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you, Renia. It's really awesome to hear about your work and the breadth of the impact is is inspiring and also important. I'm also a little bit proud to be your colleague at our university. So it's much. really great that that's happening with us, and it's clear, um, given the participants we had today, that there's lots of interest in your work. Thanks to all of our attendees. Renny, if you can just hang on a minute, but thanks to everyone. We're going to say goodbye and we wish you well. Take care and come back on the 25th. Thanks. Thanks everyone. And thanks Pamela. And it's really my pleasure and my honor.